this is on. So thank you for coming. Um, my name is Teresa Wong. Um, as Pierre mentioned, I'm a cellist and a vocalist and a composer. So this image here, okay. um, that is a piece of wood under a microscope. And I just really love this image because it, it kind of recalls or resonates with me as far as what I feel like I'm doing when I create music. And that is just trying to go into the material as deeply as I can and to bring out sounds and to bring out um, what is naturally there. And so uh, a lot of what I do is ex expanding what um, an instrument might be normally heard doing. And one example is a piece I wrote called Night Watching and it's a piece for voice and cello. And um, I'll just play a little bit before I describe this one. And then, you know, to play. much with it and yet it's it's really just a simple um, change in the instrument that creates this whole other world and of course also playing with the overtones of the strings and the overtones of what the string does when you really detune it is also very interesting um, so I want to just kind of scan through um, some various projects of mine another one is uh, called the unlearning and it's a set of songs inspired by Goya's disasters of war etchings and um, as you see, I created these a while ago in 2009, um, between 9 and 11. And many of you are probably familiar with the etchings, which I feel continue to resonate <laughs> even more so uh, as time goes on, unfortunately. Uh, against the common good, this one is what courage. And I had studied printmaking uh, a little bit in college and sort of fell in love with Goya's work. And so I decided to compose um, a piece uh, working with a, a really marvelous um, violinist and singer, Carla Kilstead. And so I created a set of songs out of a part of this collection. And then um, about a year after I had finished it, I also commissioned um, Daria Martin and Mal Malone, who are filmmakers, to create um, some of a video slide background for the piece in which 
they combined these Neolithic goddess images, um, which have been found all over Europe and the Mediterranean, um, with the work of Maria Gambutas, who was a, a Lithuanian archaeologist. And the interesting thing to me was just this juxtaposition of a culture which she proposed in her theories to be uh, matrilineal, matriarchal, and to not have evidence of warfare. And so in all of these archaeological sites, um, there was you know, evidence of no walls, no barriers, you know, the, the architecture lent itself to the idea that they were peaceful societies. Um, and in examining Goya's imagery, there's also a lot of play between the two as far as um, animal uh, deities and animal heads and, this, and the kind of supernatural in um, Goya's etchings. And so I thought the two had some kind of resonance for me together. Not just in opposition, but in their commonalities as well. There. So here's some sketches I did for costumes. So the idea of the feminine and of the, um, the divine in the feminine, which I feel is so much that becomes um, you know, the victim of violence and war in these times was very important to me in this piece. And so here's a picture also of the mourners. These sculptures were known as the lamenters. And during this particular performance at Roulette in New York, Carla was nine months pregnant, so I actually didn't want to hide that fact. And I thought it was really important because a lot of the goddess imagery also deals with fertility and um, the, you know, life generating forces of the female body. So here is one uh, little snippet of a piece about a monster. And this was uh, a year at Year of Women. <laughs> going more into the nuts and bolts of um, harmonics and the kind of exploration of tuning 
Um, so the should like I guess you could say a lot of Western European classical music is written in um, equal temperament, which means that you divide an octave into twelve equal parts, which um, you know developed through hundreds of years of musical practice and 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 was a result really of composers starting to shift keys. And so um, actually what it's doing is is equalizing these steps that in the natural physics of string vibration don't really, you know, the the harmonics of the strings don't occur in equal increments. They go um, in um, in natural proportions. And so I started to mine this area to try to understand it. Um, also working with um, composers like Ellen Fullman and Chris Brown, who compose a lot using these tunings. And um, so I began to draw this diagram for myself. So if you imagine a cello on its side, this is the, the nut, which is up here. And then the bridge is where these strings terminate. Um, if you have a string vibrating, and I'll just kind of gloss over this, and some of you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, and some of you might be quite new, but it's quite exciting to me because it's a way of understanding musical theory that feels logical. I, I never could really sit through harmony classes in school because I always felt there was some feeling of arbitrariness to it. <laughs> so um, in a way, this to me has like a very clean, clear logic because it is based on the physics of string vibration. So if you have a vibrating string that's at a certain frequency, let's say 220, which is an A, if you divide it in half, you're going to get the octave of that note. And so when I put my finger right on that halfway point, if I tap it lightly, a harmonic um, sound. And so it's kind of an airy sound. And basically it's, um, you know, it's, it's um, vibrating this mode right here. So if I press it down, it's also going to vibrate that same string length. Okay, so there's this idea that flagellate is the harmonic, it's lightly touched, and the press note. Those are two different ideas here. Um, if I divide the string again into three parts, then I get this wave. And notice here, if you press the harmonic, the flagellate here, you're going to still uh, excite this wavelength. If you press it here as a harmonic, you're going to excite the same wavelength. So that pitch is going to always be this pitch up here, which I make pink. But if you pressed this string hard onto the fingerboard, you're actually getting this wavelength. Does that make sense? You're getting uh, two thirds of the string. And then if you press it here, you're only getting one third, which is corresponding to this pitch. So this starts to create a map of like two different sets of pitches, the pressed notes and then the flagellate notes. And um, you can go on and on. So I've divided the string into five. And mind you, for people who aren't familiar with um, stringed instruments, <coughs> in classical repertoire, for example, these would not correspond to the normal equal tempered pitches. So to play in tune in classical music, you're not really finding your pitches using this method. They're, you know, they're, well, they're not equal because they get smaller as they get here, but um, the tuning is, is different than here. So what these indicate here are the frequencies and the pitches with sense deviation, which is um, there's a hundred cents in a half step. So between the very closest keys on a keyboard, you can divide that into a hundred divisions. And those are cents. So this is like a C sharp minus 14 cents, so it's just slightly flat. Um, and the equal tempered fifth, which is here, so from A to E is a fifth, it's two cents sharp. So these are you know, quite subtle, but it actually, um, the composite makes quite a difference in the sound. So here I've divided the string into seven. And on to 13. Now when you go beyond 13 on the cello, the, the harmonics don't speak quite clearly. On a longer string like a bass, you actually can um, get 
just the physics of how small the, the space is, you can actually hear more. So I've mapped it out to, um, to 13 to just try to understand why these sounds come out and where they come out, and to then begin using them more um, conscientiously, like when I compose, to be understanding, like, it's not just the, this random harmonic that comes out, but it's specifically that pitch that has a relationship to my fundamental, which is the open string. Um, and so I've been working with um, my, oh, so what's interesting is, as I started to you know map this out, um, I found a book on musical acoustics, and, and it talked a lot about different cultures and also music from around the world. And it was so great because I looked up these uh, the ancient Chinese chin, which is a it's a beautiful tabletop instrument about this big, and it's um, one of the oldest instruments I believe. And um, the tuning system. You can see these nodal points marked is really pretty much the same. The principle is based on the flagellate notes, which is the harmonics, and the stopped notes, so the pressed notes. And if any of you have ever listened, have any of you heard the music of the chin? Should please. Oh, <laughs> exciting! We need to talk. I, I just really love this instrument, and it's um, a lot of it has to do with fingering technique and how you strike the string. So the harmonics are you know, not pressed down, they're lightly touched, but also when you touch the string, you can slide and you can slide forward versus backwards, and um, I'm sure yeah. you can share a lot more, but it's really um, kind of funny to, for me to find this, it's, it's like this ancient concept that I also think is very much resonance with. Right? So. Um, so this is a part of a score for a piece that I've been developing with my partner, Ellen Fullman, for about two years called Harbors. And um, so just to illustrate how I use the harmonics in the scoring method. So basically for my part, and she plays an instrument that is really unique and amazing, which is installed in a room. And <coughs> it's at least 15 meters, 15 to 25 meters long. It depends on the space. And it consists of strings and about 40 strings, which she plays walking with rosin on her hands. So what it does is it, it's exciting the longitudinal mode. So the string, unlike the string of a cello, which is vibrating this way, is vibrating this way, which generates like a myriad of overtones, much higher frequencies than most um, acoustic instruments that we know of. So her part is here, and it's uh, mark, map, mapped out by where she walks along the floor. These are meter markings and the intervals. So the intervals are notated in fractions. And for the cello part, I've notated which string. So this is a conventional notation, Roman numerals for each string. And then which nodal point. So 6.5 means I've divided the string into six parts. And 0.5 is the fifth part. So that's the very last one. And this open circle is a harmonic, and this solid line is a press note. So that's like this very specific location, uh, the technique, and then the pitches. So these inter um, fractions indicate the pitches. And then along the way, there's some techniques as well. So I'm going to play just a few seconds of part of this piece. 